Good evening. Uh, it's Thursday evening, October the 15th. And um, 2020. And uh, I'm broadcasting these broadcasts uh, on, I made a page on Facebook called uh, First Gospel Church Dash Pastor Smith. Pastor Mick Smith. The reason I did that is so that these broadcasts would come basically in chronological order, the newest to last, or the first one you look at. And then, uh, so that um, you wouldn't, if you look at my regular Facebook page or the church Facebook page, there's going to be a lot of things on there uh, that you'd have to kind of wade through. So, in this way, it, it's to help see them a little bit more in chronological order. Anyway, uh, good evening to all of you, and God bless your hearts. It's good to be uh, back talking about the Word of God again, and uh, I've been on, my wife and I have been, <clears throat> we self-quarantined after we came back from Texas because I was in contact with uh, someone who did uh, later showed they had COVID. So our 14 days is up and we thank the Lord that uh, we've not had any symptoms at all. And so we're thankful for that. that uh, we evidently uh, dodged the bullet this time, you might say, but we, we do have several friends that, that uh, have come down with COVID and so we're certainly praying for them. Please pray for Brother Gary Green and his wife uh, and his church. A few people there have COVID. Uh, Sister Denise Green tested positive. I don't think Brother Green's tested, but he does have symptoms. So they certainly need our prayers right now. Brother Larry Bryant has COVID. He needs our prayers. And uh, I think... Uh, Curtis and Karen Golden, I believe I heard that they had it. But anyway, uh, I won't mention any more names. We just need to pray for those. Also, the family of Brother Gene uh, Worthy, uh, he passed away today, and uh, he had COVID. Of course, he had other health issues, so um, we certainly need to pray for them. And, and uh, then the, in the Houston area, the Houston church has had several people with with symptoms and several that's tested positive and they certainly need our prayers. So let's just keep praying. Um, that might lead us into, um, you know, maybe what we, we might talk about a little bit tonight. I, I've been praying some and thinking about, you know, our situation. I, I've mentioned before that, um, I know that we have had several pandemics in our in our nation and in the world uh, in the last several years, several hundred years, and uh, you know there's many lives have been lost by it, and, uh, uh, and then life got back to normal after the pandemic was over and the loss of many lives. Um, that's part of our history. And one of the things that I'm having to consider that this pandemic is different in, in this respect. You know, God has done a lot of things down through the years that has, um, he's dealt with, he's dealt with his people. And, uh, you know, if you look at the Western world, uh, our nation, uh, primarily I'm speaking of America, is uh, been a uh, a Christian nation, even though it has been, uh, you know, working its way out of uh, darkness and uh, sin, operation of sin in the world and and, um, you know, the Bible does talk about uh, the, uh, 
I don't know if I could find it, but in the I know it's in the twenty first chapter of 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 um, Luke, where Jesus was talking talking about the fullness of the Gentiles coming in and uh, the the fullness of the the Gentiles sin and iniquity and uh, God you know he lets them he lets a like for an example the world the the Jewish world the Lord dealt with the Jews and and uh, he dealt with them to a point starting them off with the law of, uh, of Moses of course uh, the walks and history of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and then finally bringing the children of Israel. Let's think about this for a minute, that God sent Israel. God did this. He put them in slavery. Uh, they were a small uh, in number group of people, 70 souls that went into Egypt at first. <clears throat> and then after Joseph was no longer uh, uh, a leader over Egypt. God God used Joseph in a great way. And, and if you'd have been looking at Joseph's life, you'd have thought God was either judging him or, or, you know, that the wrath of God was on him or something. But God was in uh, Joseph being brought into Egypt, being rejected by his brothers, and, uh, and him going into Egypt and become becoming... Uh, Pharaoh's right hand man uh, during that famine over the land to be able to bring Jacob and his children, his whole family into the land of Goshen and uh, of course after the Pharaoh's passed and the Pharaoh that was in charge didn't uh, he either didn't know or he wasn't favorable to Joseph. And um, finally, in time, they were, the, the Jews were made slaves in Egypt. And that was prophesied to Abraham that they would be there for 430 years in slavery. And of course, when you look at it, how that God uh, took that group of people and that were not really considered a people uh, of any great magnitude. And uh, he put them in, an, in, in the dragon power of Egypt, which was the most powerful nation on the earth at that time, and caused them to multiply and dealt with them there until he formed them into a number of people that he could take them out of there. And he did it uh, magnificently, miraculously through the hand of Moses. You all know the story of how they uh, went across the Red Sea and was 40 years in the wilderness. There was, <clears throat> we don't know the exact number, but around 3 million at the, at the minimum that came out of Egypt and was in the wilderness. And they had cattle and uh, sheep, and you know they. This this was a quite a, a twelve tribes of them. This was quite an enormous group of people going through the wilderness over a forty year period of time. That was God's hand that done that, and of course you all know how they went into the the um, the land of promise and the Canaan land. Finally became a nation with the king, uh, first by Saul, and then by David and Solomon, and then the, the divided kingdom with, with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and then the kings that followed in, in Israel and Judah. Uh, but God dealt with that group of people for a 2,000 year period of time, and when when the Lord, you know, uh, 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 came to that world, when Jesus came uh, as a child, uh, 
of uh, new birth of Mary, that world was in a terrible condition. And I'm, I'm bringing this up because <clears throat> of the condition of our world. You know, uh, in the ninth chapter of, of uh, excuse me, ninth chapter of Psalms, it says that a nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. Uh, I started saying a few minutes ago that the Western world, or the you know primarily America, the United States of America, was it a Christian nation? Yes, it was a Christian nation, even though it uh, was uh, lacking many things as far as uh, understanding God, uh, certainly in His completeness, because. This nation started uh, in the uh, during the Protestant era of the restoration of the church. The church was in a, I mean, that the Gentile world was in a very poor condition, very ignorant condition concerning the things of God, trying to find uh, God in in you know uh, in its search of religion and search of, of that early church. But, um, you know, when uh, I was thinking of the book of Hosea, you know, Hosea said, uh, if you look here in the, in the fourth chapter of Hosea, it says, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, no mercy, no knowledge of God in the land, by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. Therefore shall the land mourn and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beast of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, they, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. This was a prophecy of Hosea against Israel like 20 years before the Assyrians came in and destroyed uh, Israel. And uh, God's judgment was upon them. And he said, I've got controversy or I've got a cause. I've got judgment against this nation because you've turned against me. And, <clears throat> you know, it makes you look at the condition of our world today. Uh, this this United States of America, God chose this nation to restore his church. He, um, he brought our forefathers, which were God-fearing men as much as they knew how to uh, relate to God and to the word of God and, and their faith and knowledge of God. And God put this nation, uh, I believe that God developed democracy. He put it in the minds of, he put it in the minds of men. There's a, I have a, y'all excuse me for a minute. Let me see if I can get my wife to do something with this dog that's gnawing on a bone right here at my feet so loud that I can't even hear myself talk. It's for the best dog. <laughs> Could you please, Ann, take care of this for me since I'm on the air? Thank you. So, he, I don't know if y'all are hearing that, but I know it's very disrupting even to me. Um, he's, he's chewing on a, something. Anyway, this is Brother John Bud's dog. Believe it or not, we inherited him. It was an inheritance we didn't ask for. Just everybody felt like that we should take his dog and that his dog should have a good home to his real good friend, Brother Smith. And just didn't seem like there's a way for us to get out of it. And I'll just take a pause here and tell you, this dog has never been around other dogs. And he's always acted like he was going to eat any dog up that he ever saw. You know, it's like he was guarding his home when he was outside. And if you took him on a leash and he saw a dog, he'd run, pull on the leash and bark and act like he's going to eat that dog alive. So when we brought him home, we didn't know what we was going to do because we had house dogs. And sure enough, he wanted to eat our dogs up. 
you know, and so uh, first our little female Maggie, she she uh, he jumped on her, but believe it or not, she whipped him and she gave him a little spanking. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, so we're but but he's doing amazingly well. He's become friends and and. Uh, he now he'll set in, uh, he'll set down in order and when I give him treats and he'll take his, his treat when it's his turn. And he's, and now him and Maggie are buddies, they're friends. Anyway, but anyway, we're having to adjust to, to try to help this little guy. Uh, but getting back to what I was saying, the United States of America came to America and developed democracy. Democracy, I'm certain, was God put it in our forefathers to develop democracy. And even though it is a short-lived government, democracy is it was developed so that there would be freedom of religion. Our Constitution is written in such a way where there is freedom. However, our forefathers never intended for there to be as much freedom as there is. But when you have, when you allow freedom of religion so that God can work on developing his church, it allows freedom of all religions. Uh, when, you know, all of the liberalization that is given through um, the um, um, through democracy, uh, there's so many loopholes in it. And that's what's happened is we are, are over a period of time, we have more and more loopholes has been developed in, in democracy. And, uh, but it was necessary for God to develop that. If you even go back prior to the United States of America, then the organizations that developed in Protestantism, uh, you know, they were set up because of the, uh, abuse and the dictatorial government of uh, the church. Uh, there was no protection for the people. And democratic uh, government was set up in these organizations to protect the people. You know, they were set up with uh, boards trustee boards that would vote a pastor in, vote him out. Uh, the, the board was in charge. The pastor wasn't in charge. Um, he was in charge of the, of the message of the word of God for the most part, but if the board didn't like it, they could, they could uh, dismiss him and find another pastor and vote another one in. Well, that's, that's nowhere, you, you know, there's nowhere in the Bible that that's God's order of the early church. But I do believe that God allowed that down through the Protestant age for the protection of the people. You know, when the early church order, see, when you had men like apostles that were, uh, those men were in charge. Those men were rulers over the house of God, but they weren't rulers as bosses or kings. But those men were servants and they had the mind of God. They were spiritual men and they were men that had God's wisdom and they had a heart to save people's souls. At the same time, they also had judgment, but their judgment was just and it was upright and righteous and fair. Where And, and that was in the, the picture of the white horse where the first seal, the rider of the white horse, had a bow in his hand and he was going forth conquering and to conquer. That rider was Jesus. He was the rider over the horse, which was, that's a picture of the church, and it was white because it was righteous. Those men who were leaders, uh, uh, the apostolic order that was in that church, those men were righteous men and they had righteous judgment and they had righteous wisdom from the Lord. 
the Lord help them to uh, to rule over the house of God in righteousness and the proper love and servitude for the people. But when the horse changed to red, which is the color of sin, the rider changed also, and the rider had a sword in his hand, and he was given power to hurt men. And that is a picture, if you can, if you can imagine in your mind how the church fell away, it's basically just the opposite of how the church uh, uh, was in restoration. The church went from a white horse to a red horse, which is a type of Pentecostal era. Then it went to a black horse, which black is the color of ignorance and, and uh, darkness. And, and uh, so, but the red horse was a, and that was a type of Protestantism, but the red horse is a type of Pentecostalism. I believe people still had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but sin had entered into the church and uh, uh, corruption had entered in into the leadership of the government. And they had a sword in their hand and they had power to hurt men. And that's a ministry that has the word of God, but you can, you can hurt people with the word of God if you don't have wisdom. And God, God knew in restoration, he knew these things were gonna happen, but it had to happen for, for us to go through and learn through restoration the, the harm that the lack of wisdom has and the lack of knowledge has. That's one of the things he said here in the book of, uh, uh, of Hosea. If, if, let me read that. <clears throat> in the sixth verse, it says, my people, this is in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I'll also reject thee and thou shalt be no priest to me seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God and I'll forget thy children. So <clears throat> I'm just showing that, uh, you know, if, with as knowledge begin to cease and decrease uh, from that early church, it began to, affect the government and the ministry of that church. And the ministry didn't have the wisdom or the spirituality and sin had entered into that church and it caused, uh, it caused men to ha in having a lack of wisdom to uh, do things that would hurt people. Now I'm not blaming everything on, I'm not blaming everything on the ministry uh, people did wrong too, but I'm just showing you that, um, you know, I'm showing you how the church fell away and then I'm wanting to allude to the fact of how our church today, uh, our condition of the world today, that there is so much, there's so much sin in this world. I've often said that if you were in the Jewish world, when Jesus came to that world, you would you wouldn't think that it was time for a Messiah to come. I mean, you'd thank God to get everything. But what you have to understand is, is God works with a world uh, over a period of time. And God, it, in the end of the world, in the end of these worlds, sin abounds. Uh, but... Uh, uh, how did Paul say it? That grace much more abounds. When grace was entered in, it certainly takes the hand of God. See, in the end of the world, there are there is a righteous there are a righteous line of people that have sought God, a remnant of God's people that's held on to God. But the world gets more corrupt. The older the world gets, the more corrupt it gets. If you go back into America, you'll see that. America was uh, far more God-fearing, far more uh, moral. Their morals were far, far more strong. It's not that we haven't always had sin. We always have had sin. We've always had corruption. But we, we people today, they, people back then knew what sin was. Today, they don't even know what sin is. They, uh, you know, 
uh, our if you listen i was i've been listening some to the um the senate and looking at this new justice uh judge barrett uh in in going through the process to confirm her to the uh, judicial court of the uh, supreme court of america and uh, when i listen to them talk uh when i listen to the liberals talk you can see that they absolutely have no fear they have no knowledge of morality they everything has to be swung wide open a anything goes in fact, anyone that tries to put conservatism or be conservative, in fact, they're very concerned because this woman uh, declare, declares to be strong in her faith and she's Catholic. Uh, and, but that bothers them, that, that they're afraid that her uh, Christian uh, faith is going to hurt her uh, uh influence her judgment on the on the justice seat because uh, you know they want to make sure that uh, like for an example they don't want Roe and Wade overturned they don't want uh, you know all of these laws that has been passed same-sex marriage you know the um, what is that uh, term now it's been since I've, I've never been that knowledgeable of it uh, are the, uh, what is it? The LG, LBGT, that stands for lesbians, bi bisexual, gay, and trans transgenders. Uh, that was, that's been since the, in 1990, that, that was, that was, group was formed. <clears throat> uh, and, and, you know, I remember when President Obama stated before he got out of presidency that those people were going to be given every right that anybody else has, and he was going to see to it uh, that they should all have that right. And, of course, during his administration, that's when it came up for same-sex marriage and all of these things. Of course, that's totally against the Bible, but it is, you, you, you know, it is freedom. They're, they're, the, the democracy gives freedom in, in many different ways. That's why it eventually is a short-lived government uh, because loopholes, so many loopholes has found and there's so much problem in our government today. Um, and so the fullness of the Gentiles will come in the end of this world. And that's why I'm looking at this coronavirus is coronavirus, does it have to do with the judgment of God? And if it does, it certainly doesn't seem like that the people in America are getting the message. Um, I was praying the other day and I, I was thinking about this, that um, uh, I thought, you know, if God had one of his prophets like Hosea or Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, <clears throat> uh, many of these other prophets, uh, you know, Micah, uh, Zechariah, th these men many times prophesied against Israel. They prophesied judgment on Israel if they didn't do right. If we had a man today stand up in the body of Christ and prophesy judgment on us, would we hear him? Would we be spiritual enough to know whether or not it was God would we accept it or would we turn against that person because, uh, you know, that we couldn't accept that someone couldn't see how good we are? Well, I, I think we're living in a time when we really, knew, really do need to search our hearts and, and uh, work towards trying to really find the, the God of the early church that uh, as somebody asked me recently, and this has been something that's been asked before, is what is it that we're lacking that we don't have? Some men have said that with the thought that they couldn't see anything that we don't have. 
you know, what, like, what are we lacking? What are we without that would not let us get in a restored condition of the church? Man asked me that recently and I told him, I said, I'll tell you what we're lacking. We're lacking the power and the demonstration of God. We pray and pray to get some people healed and we, we, we're not accomplishing what we're praying for in many instances. And we don't have the power and demonstration that the early church had. And uh, we don't have God's backing that the early church had. We don't have signs and miracles that they had. Do we ever have any? Yes, we do have answers to prayer. Do we have any miracles? Yes, we do. I can name you some in my ministry, in my time frame that God has done some miraculous things, but nothing on the, on the same scale as I read about in the New Testament, where God stood with those 12 men in the ministry that was working under them when uh, he told them, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Uh, you know, we're, there were dynamic things that happened back there. Uh, Peter was given the key of knowledge. Somebody said, I believe it was Brother Reva Mears, Rebbe Mears, when he said he slipped the key into the lock and he turned the key and he unlocked this covenant to the Gentiles. And heaven unlocked it when Peter did it. And it's going to take men that God raises up and that God chooses and that God has given. It, to, it has to happen in God's timing uh, for us to get into that place. So I'm just saying our world, we're getting down in the end of this world. And that's why I'm looking at this pandemic. Um, it's brought change. It's certainly brought change on us Uh in a uh, magnet, in a, in a, a in great magnitude, and it's brought change on the body of Christ. We've had meetings now in the body of Christ for well over a hundred years, and we've never ever been stopped from having meetings. We're not only stopped from having meetings; we can't even have our church services on a regular basis every service. I know that there's some churches that have done it, but some churches have had to had to stop doing it too. Uh, you know, we're trying to be careful here in Little Rock. We have this uh, broadcast on Thursday nights. We're having Sunday services, but I still haven't started up Wednesday nights. Every time I start to do that, I get a check. It, you know, we bring in people from, in Little Rock's a big city, so we bring them from a lot of places, different distances over town. And the more you bring people together in, you know, the bigger chance you're taking of spreading this disease. And so we're just trying to be careful to spare God's people as much as we can. And we're feeling on God to try to find the balance of how to do this during this time. Do I think we'll get through it? Yes, I do. I know we will because I know what the Bible says and I know that there is so much yet to be done. And so <clears throat> uh, now I don't want to just be a, a prophet of doom and, and, and just painting you a, a terrible picture. But I do think we have to look at the fact that America, you know, the world, not just America, but the world is in a, uh, a very sinful condition. Remember what I said in Proverbs, um, Psalms 9, that when a nation turns against God, it'll be turned into hell when it forgets God. And this nation, as far as our leadership is concerned, and for the most part, has really forgot God. I'm amazed. <clears throat> I have new people come into the church that I can readily tell that they absolutely don't even know that they're in sin. They may be living together unmarried. They may be living in immorality. They may be using language that they don't even realize that language is sin. They, many things in their life, they don't even, it's not that they, see, there's one thing to know you're sinning. It's another thing to not even be aware of sin. 
and live without any knowledge of sin. Uh, <clears throat> and so we are living uh, down in the end of this world. The fullness of the Gentiles is coming in the end of this world. Um, I think Paul said that in, in the Romans. Let me turn to Romans, the 11th chapter here. I do want to... I do want to paint a little bit better picture here, so stay with me. I'm not just going to stay on the on the on the bad side of of what's going on in our world. Uh, but here in the eleventh chapter of um, the book of Romans, where Paul began to talk about how that we Gentiles were being a wild olive branch, were grafted in this, and then he shows how that the Jews were branches that were broken off and that we were grafted in. And then he talks about how much more they could be grafted back in. Um, let's, let's see. Let's see if we can, <clears throat> let's, let's look in uh, the 23rd verse of chapter 11, of Romans, it says, they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou were, weren't cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were, were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? In other words, he's, he's showing we as Gentiles, we came up in a different tree, wild, which the Gentiles were. They were wild, ungodly worshipers of, of idols, different gods, um, un, un, you know, uh, not knowledgeable of the, really of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet in God's time, because of the unbelief of the Jews, only a remnant in the end of that world was saved among the Jews. Uh, in that world, even though that world was corrupt, God, in his grace, opened up the door to the Gentiles. And we as Gentiles were grafted in a small group in the beginning, the house of Cornelius that Peter brought in. Later, the apostle Paul was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles and and he began to bring in a large number of Gentiles, which, however, was a very small number compared to all of the Gentiles in this Gentile world that that's came afterwards. But let me, let me go ahead and read here a little bit, just showing how the Jew will be grafted back in when. I'll read it. Um, uh, that they'll be grafted into their own olive tree. Verse 25, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So <clears throat> it's not until the fullness of the Gentiles, which I will say to you, there is a, there's a telltale mark for you that when you begin to see Jews, full-blood Jews come into the body of Christ, receive the Holy Ghost, and get this message. And they'll come in more than likely in America. They may come in in Israel. Uh, they, you know, I mean, I'm sure that they will. But I think at first they will come into this ministry in America and receive this message, this mantle of Elijah, will fall on them, which is a type of Elisha. And they'll get grafted back in. That's a, a wisdom of God that he has held them in a great gulf in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. If you remember, the rich man was the Jew. Lazarus was the Gentile. Lazarus went into Abraham's bosom. The Gentile was added to the covenant, Abraham's covenant. The Jews went into a hellish condition, and they've they've remained there. Uh, and uh, wasn't it? 
Hosea that said it would be after two days when they see him whose side they pierced. After that two days is a prophetical thousand year day. After 2,000 years of the Gentile world, saints, we are in 2020, nearing 2021. And so if the day of Pentecost was AD 33, we are, what, 12, a little over 12 years from a 2,000 year world from the day of Pentecost. And uh, so we know that we're down close to the end of the Gentile world. And the Jew will be grafted back in. So that's one of the things you can look for. So, um, so when God begins to harvest this world, God will eventually begin to harvest this world. Uh, we're, we're not in the harvest yet. It'll take a full, it'll take a fully restored church for the harvest to begin. If you look in Revelations, the 14th chapter, let's look there for just a minute. Uh, because I want, what I want you to know is, is if you look at the end of the Jewish world, that harvest took place on the day of Pentecost. And it lasted essentially for 45 years uh, until it was the judgment took place in AD 70. But I think that there was probably a half hour or thereabout uh, of the wrath of God that followed AD 70 that finished that judgment. I don't think that judgment took place just all at once, even though in AD 70, the temple was destroyed, but many things happened after that. And, um, that, that finally the church fell away and, and fell into the red horse condition. Uh, let me go to Revelations 14. Revelations 14, uh, it begins to, to talk about, and I'm, I, put this, I put this 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. Uh, let me, you know what? I'll just go ahead and say, I think it's all right for a minister to deliver his heart. Uh, you know, there's been some teaching, there's been teachings in the past that the, the, the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation was down through the thousand years. Well, I can't, I just cannot see that. And so that's not the, that's not my position on it. I'm open, I'm willing to listen, I'm willing to consider but I put the seven trumpets starting on the day of Pentecost and ending in the end of this world. And I can explain that. I certainly know why I believe that. Uh, this harvest that takes place here in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelations, uh, I believe is in the seven trumpet. And the reason for that, the, the, uh, the uh, if, you, if you take the, the trumpets, the seven trumpets, in my opinion, they started on the day of Pentecost and each trumpet blew and did not quit blowing until the next trumpet blew. They're in chronological order, just like the seals are in chronological order. And the seventh seal, when the seventh seal opens, that's when the trumpet starts blowing. And the seventh seal opens, uh, and I believe it opens uh, in the early church and the first trumpet blows, and then there's a chronological order, and so I, I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to uh, hinder any of my brothers that may not have the same position I have on it. But I wish that they would consider me. I wish they'd consider what I'm saying, because each one of those seals, when a seal opened. It, that seal had information and that information was in chronological order till the next seal opened. And when the seventh seal opened, it never did. There never was, there wasn't another seal. That seal opened in the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation and it stays open with its information throughout the end of the book. And I can explain why, but I won't take that time to do that tonight. I've got on my, uh, information there where you can text me questions if you want to, and I'll try my best to answer your questions. Um, but 
So when the trumpets blew, when a trumpet blew, that trumpet was a message that continued until the next trumpet blew. And so when the trumpet blew in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations, if you, let's back up there before I read in the 14th. In the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations, the 15th verse, it says, and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he'll reign forever and ever. Well, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons that it was thought in, in an earlier date that that was talking about the new earth. But you, you have to understand the Lord, when, when, when the church is restored and the bride's going to be made up in the end of this world, the, the bride's going to help Jesus reign down through the thousand years and he is going to be come. Uh, he, the kingdom of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. God's finally going to gain victory and the church won't fall away and he will rule over the whole world at that time. And so now this, this then, then it says, and the four and 20 elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, uh, which art and was and art to come because thou hast taken thee, thy great power and hast reigned. The Lord will begin reigning again on the white horse of the restored church down here. And then it says, and the nations were angry. You can believe just like the nations were angry. Rome was angry when the church, that white horse was going forth conquering and to conquer and they could not stop it. If you go to the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, it shows you that woman that was standing on the moon, which was the Old Testament, clothed in the sun, which is the New Testament, with a crown of 12 stars in her head, which was the apostles, the 12 apostles that ruled over that church. And she was with child. She was impregnated by the word of God to bring forth a man child, which is a type of uh, uh, the overcomers. It's also alluded to, is another picture of being the bride of Christ. And that church back there was able to bring forth, you know, Isaiah showed that uh, she couldn't bring forth. She just brought forth wind. The church wasn't able to bring forth overcomers or man child back there under the law, but un under Christ. And, and that's what I'm trying to show you, even though our world is corrupt, even though our nation, I can prophesy to you that the, the United States of America, I hope that we get another term of conservative legislature, government. That's, I hope we get another term that holds on to conservative principles and ideas. But I can tell you, if we don't, or if we do, it will soon be probably no longer than one more term if we get that much. Remember this, saints, God gave wicked kings because of wicked people. And, you know, we have to recognize what God's doing is to bring about his will. And it's not always, look, the early church, they suffered great persecution because of the wickedness of that world but it worked. It worked for God's people. It, it, it put pressure on them to come up with the righteousness and God stood with them in great magnitude of power and demonstration to show the world that he was real and to try to deal with that world. But God God knew that he was only going to be able, you know, it's like a potter with clay. He knew he was only going to be able to save a remnant out of that world. Uh, and um, so he, lets, he let a world develop. He's let this Gentile world develop. He's done so many things for America. The wars, if you go back to 
uh, World War I, World War II, the Korean War. There's been great, uh, the, the Great Depression. There has been great revivals. These things God has done is drove our forefathers to their knees and humbled them and caused them to see their need for God. Uh, we should be able to see right now that what our need is, how great our need is for God. And hopefully the Lord's going to deal with his remnant. And I know that he is. I know that God is going to empty all that he can save out of Babylon. That's talking about all of this confused religion out here. And he'll bring them into one body. He's going to bring them into, there's just one true body and all of this conglomeration of man's man's Christianity. Let's just leave it Christianity. Forget the other false religions, but in Christianity, we cannot remain doing our own will and working outside of God's order. And we have to have the order of the early church. It's the right, it's the only righteous order. The democratic order is a temporary order, and I think God granted it for a period of time to, to protect people. And then when God gave Brother William Souders a picture of and, and gave him a vision of the body of Christ, the order of the early church, it, it's take, it took this ministry a long time, and it's still taking us time to arrive at the right kind of leadership that we can have the wisdom of God to serve God people with righteousness. And that's not all a petting zoo. It's not all of we're okay, you're okay, I'm okay. No, we have to preach righteousness. And saints, the judgment of God will come with a restored church. Peter said judgment must first begin at the house of God. So it's important, it's important that we understand that, uh, you know, God wants a righteous people and we're not going to judge this world if we're not righteous. We're not going to be the examples of, of righteousness that brings judgment on the world or saves God's people out of Babylon if we're not righteous. And so God wants a righteous people. And I do believe he's got a, 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 he's got a people that loves righteousness. God's given a great knowledge to and he's still giving us knowledge. And uh, what we're waiting for is God to, to put his hands on a ministry that he can trust and back up and, uh, and cause the, the power and demonstration of God to manifest himself in the end of this world to the remnant of people that by faith, they're counted worthy, they're counted righteous, and they're children of faith and they're justified by their faith. And so there's a great harvest coming. I was gonna read in the 14th chapter. I just went back to the seventh, when the seventh trumpet blew, but it, it continues blowing. It's not gonna stop blowing. And in the 14th chapter, it's still blowing. And uh, in the sixth verse, it says in the sixth verse of chapter uh, 14, Revelations 14, 6, uh, 14, 6. It says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. That's a picture of a restored church with a restored ministry in the end of this Gentile world that it says another angel or messenger fly in the midst of heaven get up off of the earthly, devilish, sensual, earthly condition up into the heavenly condition, second heaven, if you were, having the everlasting gospel. So that's what we're longing for, saints, is a gospel that never will fall away, never will fade, that it is, it, it is completely the truth. It's not my opinion. It's not my interpretation. It's not my brother's interpretation or his opinion, but the watchman will see eye to eye and they will have the everlasting gospel 
to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and tongue and kindred and people. That's what it's talking about in the 14th chapter. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. He's going to rule and reign. And uh, saying with a loud voice, fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. Well, so the hour or the last prophetical hour of 15 years is come and God's judgment is come upon the earth. God will judge. He'll judge the first. He'll first judge the church. He will judge Babylon. Look, first, fear God and give him glory. You remember in the early church, God, you remember what happened with Ananias and Sapphira and fear fell on all of them? See, God, God put awe and proper reverence. He let it be known. I'm not going to, I'm not going to wink at sin anymore. I'm going to require your, your hand, even your life at sin. You know, he, he stated with Paul on Mars Hill when he was talking to the Gentiles there, he said, for a time, God winked at this kind of ignorance. All of these idols you have of all these gods. And here's one of the unknown God. He's the one I want to talk to you about. But I want you to know, God winked at that kind of ignorance until now. But now, he said, God is requiring. The, he said, now there is, is a day. See, there's a day that God's going to require every man to repent of his sins and to get in line with God and acknowledge the true God of heaven. And so God's not going to wink anymore down here. Uh, he won't wink at sin. Uh, he won't always impute righteousness to us. God's not counting us righteous. He's doing that because of our faith. But when God leads us to a higher place, he requires that of us. To whom much is given, much is required. So God He's, he's developing us into a righteous state. I'm not talking about uh, partly righteous. I'm talking about living above sin. And, uh, and here he's telling us to give glory to God, fear him and give him glory. But then the next message in the eighth verse, and there followed another angel or another message, messenger, ministry, saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And if you'll read the 18th chapter, you'll see where God is going to gather his people, all that can be gathered out of Babylon. That's this confusion. That's what the word Babel means. It means confusion. The world, the religious world of Christianity, again, forget the un. Uh, the false religions, but take those that have embraced Christ and Christ has been among them. If you go back to the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation, you will see that they have the light of a candle. Now that, that's not a candlestick. That's not a sevenfold light, but it's just the light of a candle. If you look up that word, it's different than a candlestick. That, but they do have light. God has given them some light and some knowledge of the word of God and workings of God because uh, the sound of the millstone, they've been working on the word of God. They've been grinding at it, trying to develop it. Uh, I was out there. I was in the Pentecostal movement before I found the body of Christ. And I know there's good men then out there and there's good men today out there. And God's not ready to bring all of them in yet. But the day's going to come that God is going to call them, come out of her, my people. And those people will come into a restored church, all that God can get out of that. But when he's done with it, there won't be any more sound of the millstone. There won't be any more light of the candle. In fact, I think the sound of the millstone out there is getting to be very light, very dim, diminished down to where you can just barely hear the sound of the millstone. And then the light of the candle is just flickering out there. It's getting to a place there's very little light or understanding, knowledge. That's what light is. It helps you to see. It helps you to know. 
And then the voice of the bride, Jesus Christ, that God's calling his people. He's calling them to righteousness. And the voice of the bridegroom, those that are hearing him and answering his call and responding to him in their prayers, in their supplications, in their uh, uh, contri con contrition, in their praise, in their worship, that sound is diminishing out there. And eventually those sounds won't be heard in her. Or any craftsman, no matter what craft they are, that's ministry, true ministry of God. God finally will turn out the lights out there and he will judge that system. You remember when uh, in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations, um, uh, let me let me give you this scripture. I think it's it's important. Uh, I'm I'm going to try to wind this up here in a minute. I didn't really know what I was going to talk on when I started, but I did have a thought about the condition of our world and trying to look at where we are and um, do I. Again, do I believe that the, the coronavirus pandemic will, so, will end? Yes, I do. Uh, end so much that we'll get back to operating in more of a normal condition, but I don't know if the world will ever be the same. In the condition our government is in, in the condition the world's government is in, the financial condition of the world, you know, the four winds. God's going to hold back the four winds, which is civil, military, financial, uh, and religious winds. God's going to hold them back. Uh, they're blowing, but he's going to hold them back from bringing total devastation until he seals his servants in their foreheads. And so, uh, uh, but he's going to judge. That's what I'm telling you. He is, I read you the second message of this ministry is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Well, if that's in the, in the seventh trumpet that opened and started blowing in the, in the 11th chapter and it's still blowing, it, there's, there, there, you can't show me where it stopped blowing. So it's still blowing and it's dealing with Babylon down here and it's going to deal with the beast. The third message is don't take the mark of the beast or the mark of his, of his image. See, that's not down through the thousand years. That's down here when the mark of the beast and the mark of his image. Down through the thousand years, Babylon will have already been judged and the mark of the beast, the beast, the mark of the beast, the false prophet, uh, that's all going to be judged. And so that's not going to be down through the thousand years. That's in the end of our world. If you go to the, to, to the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations, as I said, these seals are chronological. Remember those in the fifth seal. Let me read that to you in the ninth verse. It says, when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Here, this is showing that God's aware of the condition of these that were under the altar and the fact that their no vengeance had been taken. They, they hadn't, re, their blood had not been revenged. Is asking God, when are you going to do this? You know, they weren't literally asking, they were in the grave, but the condition was asking. It's just showing God's aware of the condition that there's not been any revenge on their blood. He said, I, I can't do that right now. Not until their brothers 
are killed in like manner. Now look, look in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelations in the first verse. Now 18th chapter, God judged Babylon. He gets all his people out and then he judges Babylon and he, he brings total judgment on it. And look what it says in the 19th chapter. First verse. And after these things, I held a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Their God finally avenged their blood when he brought judgment in the end of this world up on the beast system. And so God was faithful, he was, but he couldn't judge it. He couldn't judge it because there were still many years before the end of the Gentile world would take place. He had to wait till the fullness of the Gentiles become and let their wickedness, like he said one time, he had to wait till the, the iniquity of the Amorites were full. Uh, before he could do a certain thing. Well, he, he, he had to wait till the iniquity of the Gentiles are full before he could bring total judgment upon that because that spirit was still developing and in the end of the world, God had to judge the system. He had to judge the system of men and, uh, and he finally did bring judgment on it. Okay, if you go back to the 14th chapter, and I'll try to end with this in the 14th verse. I think most of you know this verse. I'm talking about those of you uh, that are in the body of Christ. Said, I looked and behold, Revelation 14, 14, and, and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man. That cloud is a restored church having on his head a golden crown, his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle. See, the sickle was in his hand. That's the word of God that is a reaping, it reaps the earth. Thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time is come for, the, uh, for thee to reap for the harvest is of the earth is ripe. And it said he thrust in his sickle and the earth was reaped. Well, in the same way, in the end of the Jewish world, that har there was a harvest in the end of that world and God reaped that harvest. Remember when he told his disciples in uh, John, when he said, uh, say not that it's four months till the harvest. For he said, the, the fields are white and ready to harvest. Uh, if you look at that, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it, it, the natural harvest, I'm sure the, gen, the, the, the apostles, the, his disciples probably thought, what in the world is he talking about? It is four months until the harvest. The fields are not white. They're green as a gourd. You know, the barley and wheat fields are green. It's, it's a long ways yet before they're going to turn white and bring forth uh, grain. What's he talking about? What he was saying was, look, if you had eyes to see what I can see, this world is a harvest. It's ready and coming upon the end of this world, the Jewish world. And I'm telling you the same thing, saints. We're nearing a restored church and a harvest time, even though the world's corrupt, even the world's in, in many ways a terrible condition, that's because wickedness has abounded. But the grace of God is going to much more abound in this restored church. God will gather his remnant out of this corrupt world and take us right in you know, that's, that's a picture of the children of Israel going through Jordan, it rolling back on its heaps and they went across on dry shod ground. See, and that was a time of harvest, by the way. In the springtime, the snow melted out of the, out of the mountains and ran into the streams. 
that ran down into the Jordan River and it overswelled, it overflowed its banks. Jordan was swelled with that. That's a picture of all of this conglomeration, conglomeration of Babylon and all these different organizations are gonna to come together and they will form one system. Uh, Isaiah said, in that day, seven women will take a hold of one man. All, seven's the number of completeness. Christianity will all come together and they'll call it the body of Christ and they'll call it coming together in one body, but it'll be the body of the beast and it will overswell its banks. It's during harvest time, but there'll be a ministry of God. There'll be a people of God that God has reserved out of the remnant of those that are righteous and they will lead the, the people of God through Jordan. It'll roll back. In other words, a ministry will take you right through all this conglomeration of, of religious confusion and all of the elements of the beast system. They'll take you right through that and you, this, you know, your shoes represent the gospel. <coughs> your feet are shod with the gospel and you won't get not even a smidgen of Jordan, the muddy, muddy Jordan on your shoes. You're going to cross on dry ground. That's a picture that God's going to fix you with enough knowledge and truth of the word of God that you will not be affected by falsehood or the, and you know what Jesus said? He said, if it wasn't, if the time wasn't cut short, that the very elect would be deceived. But God's gonna carry us across during the harvest time through a symbolic Jordan of a conglomeration of the swelling of Christianity's uh, Babylon. And we'll reach the other side unharmed by all of that. Praise God. So there is a harvest coming. There is, right, there is a glorious time coming for the people of God. Don't focus on this world and the conditions of this world. It's not for you and I. Remember when Elijah was up on Mount Horeb in the cave and the wind blew against the mountain and so strong that it broke the rocks. Today, the wind is blowing. The rocks are breaking against the mountain, this mountain of religion. Things are breaking up. And then the fire came down. Judgment will come. Uh, I would, I have to consider that coronavirus could be judgment coming on this world and on the sin of this world. And it's even touching some of us, which I believe that we need to consider that. We need to say, God, help us to help us to desire, help us to humble enough to desire a greater walk with you. And um, so, and then what was it? An earthquake, shaking. This world will be shaken before this is over with. But remember this, the wind and the fire and the shaking really wasn't for Elijah. He was in the cave. And that's a picture of the body of Christ. You and I are in the cave. And all that's happening to this mountain is not affecting us if you'll stay in the cave. <laughs> Stay where it's safe, saints. Stay in the body of Christ. Don't get shook out of this. And uh, if you remember, God had him go down out of a mountain. And of course, that's where his mantle fell upon a young man by the name of Elisha. And of course, Elisha followed him. That's a picture of the Jews being restored back to the body of Jesus Christ in the end of this world. And the bride will be made up and that Jewish ministry will get the mantle of this ministry. And the bride bride of Christ, the bride in Jesus Christ will lead them down through the thousand years. There's a glorious time coming for the people of God. Don't focus on the evils of this world. It's not to affect you because you, like Jesus told his disciples, you're in this world, but you're not of this world. You've been born again in a kingdom and you are a new creation. Praise God.
God's hand is upon you and your life. Hold your vision. Hold your integrity in God. Trust in him and don't get confused with the effects of this world and of man. Let's put our trust in him. He will help us. He'll see, he'll see us through this. This actually is a great time. There's, there's great things that's going to happen that you've never seen before in, this, in the generation that's right here upon us. So don't lose faith. Don't lose faith. Keep your eye, keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep looking up. Look to the hills from whence cometh your help. My help cometh from the Lord. <laughs> it, it, our help is coming from our Savior. Don't get your eyes on anything else. And God will see you through whatever comes your way. God bless your hearts. May have went over a little bit of time tonight, but uh, anyway, I just wanted to share my heart with you. Thank you for listening to me. God bless your hearts and have a good night. Those of you that are local here in Little Rock, Arkansas, I'll see you Sunday morning. I'm, I, I don't have any symptoms, neither does my wife, and we're through our uh, quarantine period, and so we're looking forward to church Sunday morning. God bless your hearts. Keep safe. Keep your, keep, keep, uh, keep looking to the Lord. Let's keep doing what the church is supposed to do. Keep reaching out to others. Keep